What would lead someone to visit a site like Pumapunku in Bolivia 50 plus times? It's because it doesn't fit the conventional archaeological story at all. There are many magnetic anomalies here that we are going to explore today, which standard archaeology doesn't even look at. These are the famous H blocks. There are a total of nine. We don't know if there were more before, but nine remain, and each one is a different shape and size. They are not identical. Something else you will notice is you see the little false door in the middle and the little false door in the middle. But this one does not have one because it's unfinished, both in the top and in the bottom. These corners here are very crisp and finished. But when we come to this one, the corners are still rounded. Again, indicating that this one was never finished. Also, in terms of magnetics, watch what happens to the compass. Also, as we move the compass towards the false door, look what happens. So, what we're looking at are at least two types of technology. One is a rough form of cutting, almost like sandblasting of the surface, creating rounded corners, and then a more precise tool that does the flattening and the corners. Now, we've had many engineers here, and they can't understand or do not understand what type of technology today could create that effect. And there's no way in hell that the Tiwanaku Bronze Age culture of between 1,000 and 2,000 years ago, that they had a technology that could possibly do this. So obviously, Pumapunku was created by a high-tech culture existing more than 2,000 years ago. We will see compelling evidence 
that the site was destroyed more than ten, or more than 2,000 years ago by some kind of cataclysm, catastrophic damage, because we'll see beautiful stone that's obviously been buried in the ground caused by some cataclysm and evidence that there is mud still covering many surfaces. And here is an example of an excavation. You can see these stones were found in place and they have the same level of precision as the stone I just showed you. And growing scientific geological evidence is telling us that a great cataclysm happened about 12,000 years ago that affected many sites around the world, including this one. And the timeline, interestingly, fits in with Plato's account of the destruction of Atlantis, which according to his records would have happened 11,700 years ago. And these red sandstone slabs, one of them originally weighing more than 130 tons. The quarry is up and over those mountains 14 kilometers away. And the theory that log rollers were used as in tree trunks to move these stones, as Giorgio has stated on Ancient Aliens, is completely ridiculous because there are no native trees at 13,000 feet elevation in this area whatsoever. So the mystery which standard archaeology has not solved is how the stone was moved from 14 kilometers away, again upwards of 100 tons, and the gray andesite stone is actually from Mount or Cerro Capia, which is located 70 kilometers away in that direction, which we will see in a moment. So this is, I'm here to give a sense of scale at Saxe Waman. And in this instance, I'm standing below what is the shape of the paw of a puma, which you can readily make out. You can see the four toes that are up and the palm and then part of the arm coming down. And that's a pictogram that was made by the builders it's not the only one, there are a number of them. There's also a fish, there's a llama, and different birds as well that are part of the actual design and structure of the wall itself. So as if it wasn't a difficult job enough, for example, this corner one, Engineer Dan and I have calculated that that's exposed. We don't know how far down it goes, but exposed, it's 70 tons. And the stone itself, some people have said that it's limestone, but we think that it's andesite. And if it's andesite, which is the local stone of the area, then it's at least six, if not seven, on the Mohs scale of hardness, which goes from one to ten. Ten being diamond. So six or seven is at least granite. And how the people made it 
Nobody knows. <laughs> so the reasoning behind the fact that all of this stone is different shapes and sizes, the conventional thought is these are the natural shapes. And so the reason why they did this is because it was the easiest way to do. You don't have to do too much work on each stone in order to get the shape. But it makes more sense, possibly, that the logic behind it was partially for earthquake proofing, that if you have different shapes put together like this, then an earthquake wave going through it, it can't find a, sta a standard pattern in which to follow through. So maybe that makes the stone more stable. Um, and in terms of accuracy and precision, this is what we're looking at. So the idea that uh, slaves were responsible for this kind of work is um, probably kind of stupid. Because you, I'm sure you can train a few slaves to be able to be precision stonemasons, but you're not going to be able to train them all. And what we find here is an example of our megalithic friends who built a lot, hundreds if not thousands of constructions farther up from Sacsayhuaman with their telltale signature, which is this curved intersection of the horizontal, more or less, and the vertical. And again, to give you a sense of scale of what, what this is that we're looking at, um, this stone by itself, I'll just walk backwards here so you can have a look at how big this one is. And around the corner. And this is the intersection point with the relatively smaller one. The relatively smaller, but we're still talking in ton, tonnage. And uh, we think the stone, again, is andesite. Andesite's at least as hard as granite, if not harder. And how did uh, a people with bronze chisels and stone hammers construct this? This is our friend Ephraim, and he's going to explain this. Yeah, and this is the snake. Snake. This is the possible the decoration for gold or for silver, no? Uh huh. Um, this is the head. Yeah. Yeah. This is the chain. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is the division in seven. Right. Seven chakras. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Seven chakras. And the snake for the Incas the symbolizes the intelligence. Right. Yeah. Right. That's the most important animal. Uh -huh. The snake them represented the underworld. Right. And Ukupache in si. and those, yeah. that is the snake is the most important animal. For the Incas they consider the totems, uh -huh. the sacred animal. Right. Yeah, and this is the snake. Uh -huh. yeah. And then the Puma is uh -huh. Puma Condor. Yeah, so Puma is the middle world. The middle world. Right. Yeah, the snake, the under wall. Right. The puma, the middle wall. The condor, the upper wall. Exactly. So yes. it's also subconscious, uh -huh. conscious, yes. super conscious. Exactly. The exactly. three aspects yes. of being. So, Dr. Weischer, you are a um, electronics engineer from the United States. Uh, I'd like to know your impressions of the stone craftsmanship, the possible evidence of some kind of cataclysmic event, the fact that the stone is brought from between 14 and 70 kilometers away, and just your overall impressions, uh, and also the magnetism, so your overall, overall impressions of Puma Punku. Well, I think it's unequivocal that it was created and engineered by a very advanced technology that uh, is not from the Amara Indians. Um, we're dealing with very precision drilling, we're dealing with very precision stonework. We're dealing with very precision transportation. We're dealing with a site that, from its position, 
must be at least 12,000 years old because we know what the water table was, what the water level was at that time. Clearly there was a dock there. Um, for what purpose, to what end, I have no idea. But clearly and unequivocally, the technology that is involved with the construction of this and the, and the fact that it's just, it's in, it's in tatters, it's in pieces. So some cataclysmic event obviously destroyed it, but for what purpose, I have no idea. It's just absolutely fantastic.